Good afternoon, everybody. This is the March meeting of the Acute Flux Myelitis Working Group. Thank you so much, everybody around the United States and other countries that have joined the meeting. The Acute Flux Myelitis Working Group is a group of clinicians, scientists, researchers, and healthcare providers and parents that are focused on understanding acute flux myelitis and particularly uh, the improvement of acute flux myelitis and the care and improvement of healthcare for patients affected by the disorder. Today we have a virtual forum that is going to be focused on a recent paper that was published in Science Translational Medicine about enteroviral circulation. But before we go on uh, the forum, I'd like to make some announcements. The first announcement is the Acute Flux and Myelitis Working Group meets every month, the third, the third week of the month. The next meeting is going to be on April 22nd. I encourage people to join in the virtual meeting because it's to be focused on what is going on with acute flux and myelitis around the world. And we are going to have a participation of researchers and scientists from around the world who have experience with acute flux and myelitis. And we'd like to learn from them what is going on with acute flux and myelitis in other parts of the world, different to the United States. The second announcement is acute flux and myelitis natural history study is going it was launched by NIH and is based at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. So this comprises more than 30 medical centers that have been recruiting patients with acute flux myelitis or mimickers for a study of this disorder. So we encourage all people around the United States and clinicians that have patients or suspected patients to contact us in case that there is interest in referring patients for the study, we are very uh, interested in, in, in be alert and ready to deal with a potential outbreak of acute flux in myelitis in 2021 20, and 2022. So again, the acute flux in myelitis natural history study that is based at UAB, Dr. David Kimberland is the leader of this study. I mean, all of the groups are basically in a high alertness to start recruiting and evaluating patients with this disorder. With that brief introduction, I'd like to pass the microphone to my colleague, Dr. Kevin Mesakar at University of Colorado, uh, who is going to be the moderator of this uh, symposium. Kevin. Thank you so much, Carlos, and thanks for putting together this session. It hopefully will be an interesting and informational one. Before we get started, I'm super excited to uh, get to introduce Robin Roberts to make a very exciting announcement, I think, for our working group and for AFM in general. Robin and I met, I think, back in 2014. It's been several years now, and she is one of the most amazing parent advocates for AFM, and the work she has done along with the AFM Association has just been incredible, and I will let her tell you a little bit of her story and make the exciting announcement before we get to the panel. So go ahead, Robin. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mesakar, and thank you to the work group for allowing me to present a little bit for a few moments this afternoon. My son Carter was diagnosed with AFM very suddenly back in 2016 at the age of three and a half and literally overnight was one of the patients that was severely affected, was vent dependent within a matter of hours, and other than ultimately trying all their agnostics that were ideation probably at the time really, was only able to regain control of a few toes. And so unfortunately he passed in August, or excuse me, September of 2018. And through the work group, through the AFM community, always looking for ways to advocate, fundraise, and make a difference. But I also work in healthcare professionally. And so one of the things I know Sorry. One of the things I know is that insurance companies 
need coding to identify patients, align coverage, and understand what's going on with a patient. And this is one of the few ways we can tell an insurance company, even researchers that look for data on patients, how to find someone. So in order to stop labeling, labeling patients with a generic diagnosis or not a specific diagnosis that is befitting to what we are able to now clinically define and identify as acute flaccid myelitis. The year before last, I tried to get a specific code that can go on every claim, whether you're, at, you're inpatient during the acute phase, you're dealing with a secondary problem, maybe with a pulmonologist or a therapist, or even years later when you're still trying to make progress. And so this year, or just last year, in the second year of trying, with the support of the CDC, Dr. Janelle Routh, Dr. Kevin Messicar, who's on here, who I've probably tweeted and messaged to way too many times over the past five years, I said, I can't do this alone. They said, I don't, I'm not, I'm not clinically relevant enough. And so they came to my aid to help fight against some of the health information management and the CDC process to get a specific code. And collectively with them and the support of the community, we are so happy to announce that beginning October 1st of this year, a doctor can have specificity in labeling a patient who is clinically diagnosed with AFM by a physician to now code that on a claim. And so code G04.82 can be used to stop the disparity in coding, define who these patients are, identify them, quantify them. And this will help guide research, therapy, align medical coverage for devices and equipment, and ultimately help track and better manage and support this entire population. So thank you to Dr. Kevin Meskar. Thank you again to the work group for your time. Just very excited that we're able to have this now. Robin, do you mind repeating the code for uh, AFM is G? G0482. So G04.82 officially becomes part of this whole encyclopedia of codes it can be combined with other symptoms and other things going on with your patients as a primary diagnosis in patient, and then at all subsequent visits as a secondary diagnosis for any problem related to AFM to help us track these patients. Thank you so much, Robin. It was all due to your effort, but also a wonderful story of, of just how the working group works, bringing together parents, clinicians, Public Health and the CDC came to the backing of this. It just is a wonderful story of practical progress being made in this area. And like you said, I think it's gonna help quantify cases that are clinically diagnosed that may not meet epidemiologic case criteria. It's gonna help families with insurance issues. And it's gonna overall just help us defining this disease and understanding more about it. So thank you again for all of your efforts and, and really can't say enough how I'm just in awe of what you're, you've been able to do, and, and it's such an honor and a tribute to Carter. So thanks. Thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce doc, soon to be Dr. Daniel Park, PhD student at Princeton under the mentorship of Brian Grenfeld, who works in mathematical modeling and epidemiology. And another congratulations to pass on. Just published a wonderful modeling study in science translational medicine, getting at a little bit more granular level of the geographic and temporal circulation of enterovirus 68 in cases of AFM that have been seen throughout the country since 2014. So we'll start with a short presentation from Daniel, and then we will open it up and I'll introduce our other panelists. And feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along, and we will pose them to Daniel and the rest of our panel afterwards. So Daniel, you can take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kevin, and thank you for uh, everyone for setting this up and coming. I'm very glad to be able to share our work on epidemiological dynamics of enterovirus C68 in the United States and implications for acute flaccid myelitis. Prior to 2020, we were seeing AFM cases every two years, and enterovirus C68 cases were also reported every two years, suggesting some correlation between D68 and AFM. But there were still several remaining questions that needed to be answered. So in this study, we wanted to 
we wanted to ask whether we can explain geographical differences in the timing of enterovirus C68 outbreak. That is, why do some states get later or earlier outbreaks? And can we relate these seasonalities of D68 outbreaks and AFM outbreaks across different states? And what what, what is driving is such biennial patterns? Why do we get outbreaks every two years, not every year? And that will this pattern biennial pattern continue? Is this, is this state persist? And so does that mean we can get an outbreak in 2020? And then we, when we started working on these questions in September of 2019, and when 2020 came, there was COVID and non-pharmaceutical interventions, social distancing, et cetera. They wanted to understand what those meant in terms of D68 outbreaks for 2020 and potentially for future so this work is based on this work builds on work from our collaborator Margarita Ponce Alert and people at CDC, which looked at seasonality of other enterovirus outbreaks in the US, which demonstrated that southern states get earlier outbreaks than northern states, which revealed some role of climate in shaping the transmission of enteroviruses and also. Margarita's work on enterovirus C68 and enterovirus dynamics in Japan, where she was able to demonstrate that these complex outbreak dynamics, in particular here, as you see, that Kokseki virus A2 and A4 exhibit biennial patterns just like enterovirus C68. And she showed that these patterns can be explained by SIR dynamics. By that, which we, we, what we mean is that people with lifelong serotype specific immunity can explain these biennial or even more complex patterns. So in order to address these questions, we used data from BioFire, which creates a multi-pathogen multiplex PCR that tests for multiple lots of respiratory pathogens at once. And in particular, they're able to predict the presence of D68 from these panel data from the, the tested from rhinovirus and enterovirus. Previously, enterovirus surveillance in the US have relied on passive surveillance, but with this hospital-based surveillance, we're able to get a more granular details how D68 is circulating across different states and at a finer time scale. So here, I want to first show what the data looks like in panel a, we see data from US and some of the states that where a lot of data come from. Here, as you, you'll notice that some of the states have been clumped together, for example, Utah and Colorado and Florida, Georgia and South Carolina. That is because of confidentiality requirements that we have to group these data together. But overall, as we see in the US, New York, and in some of the other places, we see clear patterns of outbreaks happening every two years. But in some places like Ohio, we see a more intricate pattern where it seems like outbreak is happening every four years. So we, we, we first wanted to understand when these out, outbreaks happen, which we try to plot in figure B. This is when essentially when outbreaks happen. And we can show that these, the timing of the outbreak, which refer to the center of gravity here in figure C and D, are correlated with mean latitude and mean longitude. This, this is consistent with earlier work on other enteroviruses, highlighting that earlier states essentially get, the southern states get earlier outbreaks, northern states get later outbreaks, hinting at the role of climate in shaping the spread of enterovirus C68. And then we wanted to correlate these patterns with AFM dynamics. In figure A, we're showing the D68 outbreaks shown as bar charts and AF number of AFM cases shown as red lines. We, as we see, there's a very clear correlation between what the AFM outbreaks and D6 outbreaks look like, although there are some differences that it seems like AFM outbreak has been increasing since 2014, whereas D6 outbreak has been rather stable. It is still unclear whether this represents actual increase in the FM cases, or this reflects just better surveillance. 
And we also see that it's that AFM cases appear to peak one month later than the D68 cases, which we demonstrate in figure B and C, and you can also see in figure A. But this is likely driven by the aggregation of the data. So AFM, we're just looking at national data, whereas BioFi, we're only looking at, we're looking at roughly 20 states. So it's not covering all the states and there are differential, there's different levels of surveillance depending on the use of BioFire panels in different states. But nonetheless, in figure D and E, as we show, there's a, so D is a plot of correlation coefficients between AFM cases and D68 cases, yellow being higher correlations. We see that across almost all states, there's a we see positive correlations. And in figure E, as again, we see that there's a noisy but positive correlation. Black line is for the national, and then red lines are for each state. So, so it seems like there, there's a very clear positive correlation between these number of D68 cases and AFM cases, which other studies have noted previously as well. But here we're looking at a, we're able to look at it this at a more granular scale across wide range of states. And when we look at even more finer scale data here in New York and Utah and Colorado, we see that again, the timing of AFM cases match the timing, timing of AFM outbreaks match the timing of DC state outbreak. And we also don't see the lag that we mentioned earlier, which again, highlights that the lag is probably driven by geographical variation in biofire deployment surveillance and some sort of aggregation issue not reflecting real biological lag. So then we wanted to now ask what is driving the biennial patterns of D68 outbreaks? Why does D68 outbreak happen every two years? So we adopted the methodology from Margarita, that we sure that you, was used to study other antivirus dynamics. So essentially, we can come up with a mathematical model that assumes lifelong immunity. Once people get infected, they completely recover and they can get they cannot get reinfected. And in such model, we can show that can match the observed dynamics of D68 quite well. So here, the white, white panels are where we try to match the model to the data, and orange is where we try to predict future dynamics. So in, in some cases, Missouri and Utah, Colorado, the fits and predictions look very good. New York and Ohio, fits look good, but predictions are a bit difficult, suggesting prediction from short time series can be difficult. But when we try to include more data, we see that we do get a better prediction, suggesting that the lifelong immunity from an enterovirus C68 infection alone can indeed explain the dynamics, outbreak dynamics, the every biennial patterns of the DCC outbreaks. But we want we do want to stress that. What matters here is our research suggests what primary infection is likely important. So it does not necessarily preclude the possibility of secondary infections, but as long as secondary infections don't lead to a significant amount of transmission, then it will be consistent with our model. And we further tested these simulations that we could also demonstrate that the, the outbreaks may not continue every two years, that biennial patterns may not necessarily be stable. So when, so when 2020 came, we now had to ask, what is the impact of this pandemic on D68 dynamics? What, is, what are non-pharmaceutical interventions and social distancing measures going to do to, end, to the spread and circulation of D68? Early in 2020, we 
we're seeing decline in enterovirus cases in other countries, rapid declines. Here I'm showing Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan. By around March, April, they were reporting based essentially almost no enterovirus cases. In the US, unfortunately, we don't have data, particularly because the D68 prediction algorithm from BioFire relies on certain certain versions, but after which became no longer available after their product update. But we can still, since we can still use our mathematical model to try to predict whether an outbreak in 2020 would have been possible and what if there's decreasing contact rate and therefore transmission rate due to distancing measures, then what, what would that mean in terms of future outbreak. So here we're e evaluated the possibility of the 68 outbreak in 2020 across a wide range of scenarios. First, under normal conditions, and what if there's a 5%, 10%, and 20% decrease in transmission? So here we see in the very top panel, panel B, we see a yellow strip around September indicating that a large outbreak in 2020 would have been possible. But as we see, as we introduce Decrease as we decrease the transmission rate, these trips disappear, suggesting that even the modest 20% decrease in transmission rate could have prevented the outbreak. So this work, these few predictions we initially made in April, around April and March, as we predicted, there were no AFM outbreaks in 2020. Though we, we cannot, unfortunately, again, due to the product update, we cannot assess whether there were no D68 outbreaks, though there were certainly decreases in reportings of D68. And I think other people, Kevin, including Kevin, could share their insights from clinical clinical insights. So what does this mean in terms what, what is gonna what is going to happen for future outbreaks? Would, would we get more D68 AFM outbreaks in 21, 2021, 2022? We do not have data for D68, but we wanted to allude to a study read led by Rachel Baker in our group, which directly tries to answer this question for generally for endemic diseases. In this paper where she focuses on RSV, but the general conclusions will still hold. So this figure I summarizes her findings very well. I want to point at figure C first. So where blue strips are showing when non-pharmaceutical interventions are put into place and red lines are showing model predictions. So before the outbreak, RSV show was showing very clear annual epidemic patterns, but when non-pharmaceutical interventions were put in place due to COVID, the cases of RSV declined rapidly. What this means, is that we are, normally we would have an outbreak in 2020, but since we're missing the outbreak, we are not letting the population develop immunity that would otherwise have developed in the population. So we're letting the susceptibility to increase, as we see in the blue dash line here, which is the proportion susceptible, and as susceptibility in population increases, Eventually, when we lift the intervention measures, we can get a larger outbreak in the future. But there is large uncertainty in when, how large this outbreak will be, which is shown in the top row of panel A and B. And it, there's also, which is showing the uh, peak epidemic size. As you can see, it could range from one to nine, so it's one being the same ratio and nine being ninefold increase in epidemic size. And there's also large uncertainty in when this the next epidemic will happen, which is shown in the bottom row, peak date, as you can see, could happen anywhere between 2021 and 2025. And these depend on how long these interventions are put in place and how much, how strong these interventions are. But the key takeaway is that putting interventions on 
and prevent and preventing an outbreak is good for now, but it will cause the population of susceptibility to continue to increase because we're missing outbreaks and that could lead to greater outbreak in future. So in summary, our study was able to demonstrate strong spatial temporal correlation between DC-68 and AFM cases, providing ecological support for their causality. And we also predicted that a major DC-68 outbreak would have been possible in 2020 under normal conditions, but decrease in contact rate due to current intervention measures likely prevented DC-68 outbreak and possibly AFM outbreak, but this means that the population of susceptibility will start to build up and at some future, we could be getting a larger outbreak. And so we, I wanted to thank some of the collaborators and people at, especially people at CDC and the, the New York and Colorado Department of Public, Public Health Departments that also shared their data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was really, really great and will be a great jumping off point for questions in the panel. Encourage the audience again to keep putting your questions in the chat and we'll try to address them as they come in. I will tackle the first couple questions, but first I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel. I'd like to start with Dr. Adriana Lopez, who is in epidemiology at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on the acute flaccid myelitis team that's been working on this for many years now and is one of the nation's experts in the epidemiology of AI. Uh, Dr. Charles Chu, who is an MD, PhD, infectious disease uh, physician and researcher, clinical microbiologist, and sequencing guru galore. Uh, at UCSF has done a lot of the work in sequencing EVD-68 isolates, and now you may see him doing a lot of the sequencing for some of the SARS-CoV-2 variants and brings a very unique perspective from molecular epidemiology side of things and the clinical micro side of things as well. I introduced Dr. Daniel Park, who will stay on, and our last panelist will be Dr. E. Mostafa from John Hopkins who I just met today, but I know has done a lot of work in the epidemiology surveillance and sequencing of isolates through the efforts at John Hopkins. So I think we have a great panel today, hopefully that can address a lot of your questions. I think a lot of the answers are gonna be unknown for the future, but using Jan Daniel's data as a jumping off point, we'll try to generate some good discussions of preparedness and what we can do looking forward to the seasons that come. I will start with the first few questions that came up in the chat that had to do with the EBD68 signature on the BioFire platform. And I'll kind of start from the very basics from scratch on this clinical testing platform by BioFire for those who aren't as familiar. So BioFire is a commercial company that provides clinical testing platforms their respiratory pathogen panel is a multiplex PCR panel that tests for several respiratory viruses and a few bacteria. And one of the targets on there is an enterovirus rhinovirus target for that family of viruses that are so genetically similar, they do not report out whether it's a rhinovirus, whether it's an enterovirus or the type of enterovirus. However, they realized as they started to develop their trend program, which is a program by which they get de-identified data from centers who sign on, who get their testing results and provide epidemiologic real-time monitoring of the pathogens that are going through your system region, the country, um, that this could have some implications to improve our surveillance for enterovirus D68, which many of us know does not have a clinically available test. After the 2014 outbreak, the CDC really was the only place you could get testing for EBD-68. After that, several institutions developed their own EBD-68-specific PCRs, but in general is not clinically available. And so the epidemiologic data has been mostly nationwide, looking at when we see EBD-68 show up, when we see AFM cases show up. But Daniel's data 
digs into this signature, which getting back to it, what Biofire did in the paper that I posted there, which was not part of this effort, which was prior to this effort, was they took these EVRV known samples, they ran an EV68 specific PCR to know which ones of them were EV68, which ones were not, and then used some machine learning to look into the intricacies of the melt curves for the rhino entro targets that make up um, the target that reports out rhino entro virus. And it's imperfect. So um, I posted the sens sensitivity and specificity there. It's in the mid 80s. So it was not clinically reportable on a case by case basis, but on the larger epidemiologic scale was able to tell us kind of in a heat map way when EV68 was showing up in which regions of the country at which time, all the way back to when the RPP testing had started with BioFire. That allowed us to do a more granular analysis of the association between AFM cases in those regions and EV68 circulation. The really unfortunate part that Daniel uh, slid in there at the end that I put into the comments in, in response to the second question was that this signature was recently lost as the panel was upgraded. So the RPP 2.1 that includes the SARS-CoV-2 target now has lost the ability to have this EB68 signature. So we can learn from the patterns in the past, but we aren't going to be able to continue to use that with the same level of robustness in the future. So I will stop hogging the panel discussion there, but Dr. Mustafa or any of the others that asked those questions, does that answer your questions as far as the biofiber signature? And again, I'd refer you to that paper by Myers and, and JCD. Thank you, yeah, that's just great. All right, I've got to scan the chat real quick because I was talking. Let's start with the first question that I see coming in after that. Is there any way to use these tools to predict the potential evolution of the virus during a downturn? Would you expect increased variation away from the current B3 and A2 and D? For those who aren't aware, there's a little bit of discrepancy in the literature of what to call A2 versus D subclades. Would they be limited due to lack of cases and resulting immunological selection? What a great question. And um, I'd start, if any of the panelists want to jump in, otherwise I'll, I'd point it towards Charles too to start. He's done a lot of work on variants for SARS-CoV-2. These are RNA viruses. What would we expect to happen during a low circulation year as far as changing of clades, evolution? What would your experience suggest? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, and you know, I I, I would say right off the bat that we probably don't know for sure what's going to happen with regards to evolution, and part of the reason why it's it's very difficult is that, as you know, there have been very few actual cases. You know, there's been a sharp reduction in cases overall. In general, for RNA viruses and enteroviruses are RNA viruses. For RNA viruses, you would expect that the the emergence of of, of uh, mutations and selection and essentially evolution of 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 variation typically occurs if you have ongoing replication. So the more cases in general, the more likely it is that that we're going to see variation. I would expect that during this downturn that there probably is going to be less variation. So I would be, it would, but the other thing I have to caution about is enteroviruses are very, there's a lot about enteroviruses in particular that we don't really know. Although the, you know, the, some the work that, you know, Daniel presented is fantastic. It's, it, it still is the fact that for many outbreaks, we don't know exactly for sure why is it that certain clades or certain genetic lineages of the virus will, will tend to be predominant, say, in a given outbreak versus another one. And it's, it's actually several reasons, of one of which could include simply random genetic drift, so what we call the founder effect, where essentially it just happens to be in a susceptible population. If you have one particular everything else being equal. If you have, for instance, several enterovirus strains that all have the capacity of, of causing AF, in, in, it, it really is, in some cases, it can be random, where it, you just happen to have an outbreak in the right place with, with the susceptible population. So I would say that 
that we currently don't know exactly. I would predict that probably we're not going to see much of a difference, although that certainly could be, it, that certainly may be wrong, you know, given, given, as I said before, the difficulty of kind of predicting exactly what clades of enteroviruses would be associated with any given outbreak. But I do think that it, the, the question is really, I think, important in that it really highlights the need to actually do genomic surveillance. And so, so Dr. Masakar, Kevin mentioned about currently that, you know, without, currently it's going to be difficult to do s- surveillance with the biofire because we don't have the capacity of identifying enteroviruses. But I would actually go a step beyond that and saying that without doing genomic sequencing, we, we won't have a, a way to identify clades. And so I think ultimately, it's, it's going to be really important to continue to do genomic surveillance for, of enterovirus D68 as we are currently doing genomic surveillance of sars cov 2 for instance. Dr. Mustafa, do you have anything to add? I know you've done a lot of work on molecular epidemiology of... Yeah, so I, I wanted to also like follow up on Dr. explanation of the first half of the question, which is mainly about the tools uh, that can different that can actually differentiate between the different clades and uh, clarify a little bit the different options we usually have. The diagnostic approaches in the clinical lab uh, for enteroviruses relies on detecting kind of a conserved area in the genome, which is the five prime UTR region. And this region usually does not differentiate between enteroviruses and the rhinoviruses. And this is the same approach that the biofire assay also uses. So to be able to look at the genomes and identify D68 versus others, or also differentiate the different subclades, we need to look into a more uh, like species or type specific region in the genome, which has been BP1 region. And uh, there are like the classical method to do this was Sanger sequencing, which, which has been like not very frequently done for enteroviruses, unfortunately. And this is why we don't have a lot of data about this surveillance nationwide. This biofire method for concluding signatures is actually very, uh, it was like very elegant because like this is, a, this is an assay which is used clinically. So you can really have a lot of data if the sensitivity is acceptable, which I think it is. Then the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that those clades uh, or subclades data that we have were mainly then based on that BP1 sequence, but then there aren't many whole genomes available also to give us more information. So there is actually a lot to be done and implement uh, surveillance-wise to like provide better understanding of, of this, of like the circulation, the and the different types that are circulating in different places. Well, thank you so much. I think if there's one thing we all are going to agree on on the panel is that we need better molecular epidemiology and and sequencing of of enteroviruses in general. For those of you who haven't seen it before, the Next Strain website, N-E-X-T-S-T-R-A-I-N, website uh, does molecular epidemiology for a series of emerging pathogens and has included enterovirus D68 in that. And they take all of the publicly available sequenced isolates, be it DP1 or whole genome and throughout the globe and do a nice phylogenetic analysis and geographic analysis of which strains are circulating where. However, that's extremely limited by where sequences are coming from. So if things aren't getting sequenced, they're not going to show up there. And I think Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Chu both made that point very strongly that we need more sequencing of more isolates. I will call on Dr. Lopez next because the CDC and others, I think, have recognized that our enterovirus surveillance has been a pretty passive system for a long time through the National Enterovirus Surveillance System, but has started to beef up efforts, including engaging some additional surveillance networks to get better enterovirus D68, at least a surveillance. So Dr. Lopez, do you want to talk about NBSN and some of the other efforts of CDC? Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so as Kevin mentioned, we are 
we have put together, there's a new vaccine surveillance network that has been looking at, it's an active prospective population-based surveillance network, and it's for acute respiratory illness in children less than 18 years of age. And what happens is we enroll kids who are hospitalized or visit emergency departments at seven medical centers across the U.S., and specimen collected from these patients and then tested. And this was originally for acute respiratory illness. And then we had added on AFM a couple of years ago. And so they test specimens from, most of the sites test specimens from July through October to look for enterovirus circulation and typing. So they'll test and some sites will test all specimens for EVD-68 specifically. Others will test only those that are enterovirus, rhinovirus positive, and then look at those for testing. So that's what we've been using in terms of active surveillance, kind of to look and monitor circulation of enteroviruses to help kind of act as a possible alert for us for AFM. So we've been using that for the past few years. And with 2020, you know, I don't know if many of you know what the, well, as Brian mentioned, there weren't many cases in 2020 as we had expected or anticipated. We had a total of 31 confirmed cases when in 2018, we had 238. So 2020 ended up being more like a non-peak year. And we looked at our data from our NVSN sites to see what was going on in terms of enterovirus circulation and EVD-68 circulation. We did see some sites had EVD-68 detected, but this was very site specific. Not all of the sites had it. Um, there were low numbers though, but what was interesting was that the numbers that we did see were a little higher than what we'd see in non-peak years, but much lower than what we saw in 2018. So it was interesting to look at that. And they continued testing for EVD-68 through December just to see if maybe the um, pandemic had caused a shift in circulation, but they didn't have any detections in December. And we're also looking at our national enterovirus surveillance system to see if there are ways that we can improve that. That is a passive system. One of the main reporters to that system is CDC. So the specimens that we get get put into that system, but it really depends on what labs are reporting to that system. So hopefully we can increase uh, participation to help boost that system as well. Great, thanks so much, Adriana. For those who are submitting questions and feel comfortable with it, try to hit the button to send it not only to all panelists, but to the audience too, because I'm getting a bunch of really interesting comments, but I don't think everyone can, can see them. So I don't think people are meaning to send them privately, but if you don't mind sending your comments to the whole audience, that'll help us follow along. I'll take the next question, which didn't go out publicly, but it's from Dr. Amari Fall, who for those of you who have not come across his work, is one of the few people in Africa and West Africa doing molecular work with enteroviruses and with EVD-68 and has put out some nice papers that this is not an isolated North American or European problem. This is really showing up throughout the globe. And he asked the question that I think is on all of our minds after watching Daniel's presentation is, you know, with the lull in 2020, what do we expect in terms of this coming back? And I'm going to take this in a different direction a little bit, because I think we have talked about the year-to-year -year variations. And my personal take on this is that enteroviruses don't like even numbers. There's no reason why they came 2014, 16, 18. They just need warm bodies that are susceptible to circulate. And so certainly the fact that we missed a big circulation year in 2020 would mean that there are more susceptible children out there in 2021, 2022, and really depends on what mitigation strategies are in place. So I'm going to pose the more challenging question to the group with other respiratory viruses, for example, RSV, and perhaps starting to maybe see a little with influenza that were socially distanced away, didn't see normal circulation periods. We're starting to see some signs of non-seasonal emergence, particularly with RSV in Australia, where they had a a fairly large RSV 
outbreak that was not in their typical RSV season. So when we see enteroviruses come back, because I will answer Carlos's title of this presentation, are enteroviruses going to come back? Yes, they will. We don't know which ones and we don't know when, but when they come back, would you expect them in our temperate areas where they typically show up in the summer to fall, that they will show up again in that specified period or should we be expanding our surveillance as you know CDC did with some of their surveillance networks to look for non-seasonal circulation? Could this show up in the winter? Or could this show up in a season that we weren't really prepared for it? And anyone who wants to jump on that uh, grenade, feel free. Uh, maybe I can start uh, by just giving uh, a little bit of, uh, of our own data from the clinical lab for the season. Uh, so you are right that this is a very unique flu season or respiratory season that turned out to be really not a flu season. So we have not seen any influenza or RSV until recently when we started to see like very, very few, like maybe three RSV and three flu. But we didn't stop seeing rhino slash entero positives. So we have been seeing positives for the whole year. The total numbers have been less than uh, a conventional classic year. But also the, the total number tested was also less because the clinics were closed and the many practices were closed. But it was fascinating that the, the extended respiratory panel, uh, enterorhino was like the, the, main, the main target detected, then followed by, by very few cases of adenovirus. We have been of enterorhinoviruses we started to do this, this in 2019, and we continued to look at 2020 specimens. And it's actually remarkable because, you, as, as I mentioned, those assays from the extended panels, they actually don't differentiate between rhino and enteroviruses. So we started actually our algorithm by testing those positives with a little bit of a more specific PCR assay that can be more specific for enteroviruses, and very, very a small percentage of those was positive with this more specific assay, indicating that the main virus circulating is actually rhino. And then within those positives, we sequenced them with Sanger based method to, to type. And it was interesting to see Basically, also a large percentage of them will type to rhino. And then within the very teeny tiny numbers of that type into N, we saw more enterovirus B68s in 2020 than in 2019. But it's still like a small number. So we, we, I, sh I should say we had enterovirus B68 circulating in So why, why didn't we see outbreaks and so on? I think it's a still because of the unique pattern of the year with social distancing and everything in place, but it's also remarkable that it has been circulating. So I, I will give, give the chance to somebody else to jump in. Well, I just wanted to say that with the NBSN sites, there are a couple sites that do test year round. So they're looking at it as well, but we're also, starting a project with our emerging infections programs and two sites to do some enterovirus surveillance, looking at more severe neurologic illness, but that will also be helpful in terms of looking at enterovirus circulation. And I would just add our local data, we tested over 400 specimens in 2020 and it didn't have a single, and those are all EVRV positive and the biofire data have a single EVD68 positive. So it may have been spotty like was seen in NBSN where certain areas saw a small amount of circulation, but nationwide, we didn't see a large outbreak. Dr. Mustafa, you brought up another question that I'll bring Daniel and Adriana into, which is something that no one's been able to explain to me thus far. I have my own theories, but why did rhinoviruses emerge first when we saw respiratory viruses start to reemerge after the initial lockdown? It, could this be explained by the r not of the various viruses, SARS-CoV-2 being you know, the highest and continuing to circulate with the lack of immunity out there, rhinovirus potentially being less, but, or less than SARS-CoV-2, but 
EB68 potentially less than that? Why do we see rhinoviruses emerge, but we didn't see as much enterovirus disease? I unfortunately don't know either. It's something that we've all been wanting to know, but I've heard hypotheses about maybe something to do with some of the viruses being enveloped and some of them not being enveloped, but I have not seen any answers for why rhinoviruses are. But it seems like it is a very persistent pattern across different countries, not just US. We see it in Asian countries, European countries, that even when before, I think even when other respiratory pathogens didn't come back, when other respiratory pathogens were, it basically died out, the rhinoviruses seem to be persisting in these countries. Yeah, and Adriana, unfortunately, I don't. Circulating around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I don't really have any additional thoughts. <laughs> back on what Brian said, it's hard to really know why, but we're, you know, we'll continue thinking about it and trying to explore different things, but yeah, as of right now, we're not, just not sure. And I wanted to make a quick practical point in question to Dr. Tu and Mostafa. There's a few comments coming in on the kind of poor quality of the genomic data of the sequences coming out on EV68 and also make the point that we've talked a lot about EV68 today, but we know that other non-polio enteroviruses also can cause AFM, so need to be looking for them and aware of them. But on a practical question, for specimens coming to you to be able to recover whole genome, what can the clinicians on the call do in terms of what are the best specimens to collect, what media to put them in, what transport, how to get them to you with the best chance of getting the highest quality data once they hit your lab? So maybe I can tackle that. So I, I think, Kevin, you had two questions there. The first question is with regards to the metadata and the importance of metadata in sequence databases. I'll tackle the other question, which is on, on sample acquisition. I mean, so typically, our interest is, so for genome sequence recovery, it's really, we want to, we want to obtain essentially full-length intact RNA. And because RNA is, is quite labeled, you know, typically we would like a specimen ideally to be essentially frozen as soon as possible, or, or currently for our clinical, for our clinical assays, we typically, uh, the specimen stability requirements are that they be frozen within six hours of collection. And that's not always possible, but, but for us to report, say, a clinical result, either from, met, from a metagenomic test or from a direct PCR test, it should be frozen within six hours and, and kept frozen. In terms of the actual sample type, we have been primarily looking at nasal swabs in either a UTM or VTM, although I, I do... I'm aware of, we've, we have actually also been doing some studies of saliva. Similarly, as there's been interest in moving, in potentially moving the saliva. Um, we haven't seen, I think, we haven't seen the same, the same trends as with SARS coronavirus 2, where we're actually seeing actually higher viral loads in saliva. So, but, but we do think that there may be comparable viral loads. So saliva might be an interesting sample type to validate, especially because, you know, many groups are collecting saliva, you know, and so for sars cov at least in, in outpatients or in asymptomatic um, infections. So, and it's an easier sample to collect than a nasopharyngeal swab. So with regards to, as long as it hasn't been thawed on, on multiple freeze thaws or been and, you know, aliquoted or used for other purposes, I mean, typically we want essentially as fresh a sample as possible, freshly frozen for genomic sequence. With respect to the actual titer, We've been successful, so we use a variety of methods to, to actually detect enteroviruses, to sequence the genome of enteroviruses, and that's primarily because enteroviruses can be, the titers can be very low, and it really depends, especially in, in acute facet myelitis 
patients where uh, th their presentation may be several days, in some cases weeks after their an onset of symptoms. So because the titers are very low, uh, we've adopted a variety of methods to do genome sequencing. So they include um, a tiling amplicon method where you essentially design primers across the genome and run PCR, uh, multiple PCR reactions at the same time. That's the idea. We also use we also have a spiked primer enrichment method that was developed in my lab, where we essentially enrich for enterovirus D68 sequences, and we increase the sensitivity of metagenomic sequencing. And then there's another method, which is a capture probe method for enriching as well. In general, if the cycle threshold by PCR is less than 32, uh, we've been quite successful in getting the entire genome. If it's above 32, then we can, in some cases, get partial genome sequencing, or we may as Dr. Mustafa commented on, we may choose to restrict our sequencing to say the VP1 gene region for typing purposes. But in general, we prefer that the cycle threshold be less than 32, although we have been successful in recovering genomes up to 38. So, but, but that's really sort of sketchy, your ability to recover genomes at that level. The, the second question that you had, which is really relevant on in terms of the clinical metadata, in our experience with sars cov one of the major issues is not the issue of not being able to get clinical metadata. It's the issue that it, it really depends on who's doing the sequencing and how we're doing sequencing. So for instance, public health agencies that are doing sequencing for surveillance methods. There are often lots of restrictions regarding the metadata that you can actually provide and collect. So in, in some cases, we've had difficulty, for instance, in even providing collection date, because the collection date is thought to be potentially uh, uh, you know, an, an identifying information. So I, I think that this is a challenging, not only with respect to enteroviruses, but with respect to viral sequencing in general, in terms of providing metadata. I completely agree with everyone that metadata is critical for being able to understand the you know, the clinical relevance to the importance of the sequencing information. In fact, arguably, sequence information without metadata is, is, is close, is very, very, not very useful. But the, uh, what really needs to be done is more coordination between hospitals who can provide clinical metadata linked to, say, the, the genomic sequence and patient information, and more coordination between hospitals and county and state and national public health agencies as a way to provide a, a more centralized network for, for not only doing the sequencing, but also acquiring the metadata. Thank you so much, Charles. So we're hitting the top of the hour. So to briefly summarize for our clinicians out there, I, I, the points I would pull out from Charles is particularly of interest to this group. In AFM cases, we're already behind the eight ball in that those patients are typically around a week after their respiratory prodromal onset. So that's when viral titers are going to be lower. So you want to get that sample as soon as you suspect AFM. Currently, the gold standard specimen is a nasopharyngeal specimen. That's the deep brain tickler specimen. Until we get better data, we are conducting a study at our site funded by CDC to look at the shedding curve of EV68, so doing serial swabs of children over 21 days to see how long they shed virus for. And as part of that, we're actually going to try to validate mid-turbinate swabs, so not all the way back but a little more shallow. And a lot of this work is being done for SARS-CoV-2. And we're also getting saliva. So if people are interested in collaborating, Dr. Hai Win Tran here is coordinating a study, which we should have samples to collaborate with others. It would be really nice if we had less invasive sampling if possible. And if I had to summarize this whole discussion, we started out with a, a wonderful presentation on predictions for the future, but I think even Daniel will tell you our predictions are only as good as the assumptions they're built on. And though we can't perfectly predict the future, I think Adriana will say we can prepare for what could be coming. So I think preparedness is a different discussion than prediction. And though we try to use the best data that we can to predict seasons that come, we really can control our preparations. And I think the CDC on the public health side, this working group, the parents group, is all working to do our best to, to prepare if this does come back, that we're more ready to get good specimens, to get better sequencing of those specimens, to get better information to hopefully in the future provide better care in terms of treatment and prevention for these kids. So I appreciate our entire panel for all of your expertise and your contributions. What a wonderful way to start the talk with Robin Roberts and the 
great success and having an ICD code. Remember in October, you can now code a patient at diagnosis with a diagnosis code for AFM, which is gonna help all of our future efforts and I would encourage all of you guys new to the working group to join these monthly calls. It's a really great collaborative group. And we look forward to working together with all of you in the future. And I will pass it back to Carlos to close things out. The only thing that I'd like to add is our great thank you to all panelists, to Daniel, to Charles, to Eva, to Adriana, to Robin, and Kevin, thank you so much for playing the role of moderator. And to all of you, thank you for participating in this uh, virtual forum. Again, please keep in your calendars that every Thursday, the third Thursday, the next one that we are going to have is on April 22nd at two Eastern time. And I appreciate that there were many participants from other areas of the world. I can see participants from Japan, from Africa, from Netherlands and Europe. Thank you so much for being available for this meeting and we hope that you can continue joining us for the next virtual symposium and stay safe and thank you all of you for participating in this uh, uh, panel and symposium. Bye now. <laughs>